I'd like to call the second special meeting of the 2019-2020 Common Council to order. Will the clerk please read the roll call? All right, I'm just going to call out your name. Let me know if you're here. Alderperson Donahue? Here. Alderperson Wolf? Here. Ackley? Here. Savaglio? Here. Decker? Here. Phillips? Here. Sorensen? Here. Bourne? Bourne? Here. And Here. Mitchell? Here. Jim, please turn down the sound in your room. There are nine present. And, um, all the person Feldy is excused. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next will be uh, Mayor's announcements. Thank you. A lot has changed since our last city council meeting. I've called the special city council meeting to update the Sheboygan residents on the coronavirus pandemic and the response in Sheboygan and Sheboygan County. At our last meeting, we had just closed the Senior Activity Center, the water utility in Maywood. And the next day, Governor Evers closed all the bars and restaurants and limited gatherings to 10 or less people. City buildings have now been closed to the public, except for public meetings, appointments, and early voting. All city departments are manned and operating. All parks are closed and shelter rentals have been canceled. And last week, I suspended enforcement of the alternate side winter parking regulations. And I also announced that the police department will not charge late fees on uh, pet license renewals. For the last five years, the employees of the Kohler Credit Union have organized the Memorial Day Parade and Program to recognize and thank our veterans. Today, in conjunction with the Kohler Credit Union, we are announcing that due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Memorial Day Parade and Program will be canceled. The governor's safer at home order marks new and uncharted territory for all of us. Tonight you will hear from some of our dedicated department heads and several community partners on how they are adjusting to this new normal in Sheboygan County. I appreciate the commitment of all the staff here at, at the City of Sheboygan and these community partners who are doing their best to continue to deliver the services that our residents need and expect. Last year, the council approved allowing remote meetings as long as there was a quorum of members in the meeting or attending remotely. We have begun to use this new policy to continue to hold our meetings as normal. All meetings will take place in the council chambers during this period at City Hall so that the meetings can be easily broadcast to the community and normal business of the city government can continue unimpeded. No one knows when the situation will end, so I'm asking for everybody's patience and understanding during this difficult time. Uh, we want to remind everyone to wash their hands as often as you can, keep a six foot distance from others, cover your cough, stay at home if you're sick, do not assemble in groups of 10 or more, restrict your shopping to groceries, pharmacy, and takeout dining, and stay safer at home. Now we'll begin our city department reports, and please hold all questions until the end of the presentations. Next to City Administrator Daryl Hoffland. Uh, thank you, Mayor Vandersteen. Uh, first off, I want to thank city staff for the continued public service in light of the current challenges, including potential personal health risk. I also want to extend my appreciation to Sheboygan residents who have taken time to show their support of city staff. Over the past three weeks, city leadership has been in contact, has worked with the governor, with governor Evers office, 
Sheboygan County, including the Emergency Management, Public Health Office, Sheriff's Office, Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, Sheboygan Area School District, uh, Advocate Aurora Health, St. Nicholas, and numerous Sheboygan nonprofits. Several of these community partners, in fact, will be providing a brief presentation tonight. Residents or businesses interested in learning more about service level changes can find updates on the city's website, including a section on COVID-19 resources. Many of the city links are referrals to the county's public health office website. Please rely upon this county site for health related daily updates. For businesses interested in learning about federal and state programs, please go to the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce website. The chamber will be coordinating with the SCEDC to share information so this will be the go-to site for local Sheboygan businesses. In closing, I want to uh, identify my appreciation for the management team and working with their staff to find a balance for continued, to continue providing public service while being sensitive to the staff's personal matters. Next up is David Beeble, who will be appearing remotely. Thank you, Daryl. Um, can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like just to give the council and uh, those participating a, a quick update on the Department of Public Works activities. Uh, one, one of the, probably the, the earliest decisions that we've talked about is uh, we suspended the Superior Avenue reconstruction project um, which was going to be from Taylor Drive to approximately 29th Street, immediately adjacent to St. Nicholas Hospital. We've suspended that project for the next 90 days. After 90 days, uh, depending upon the situation, we will evaluate if that project moves forward this year or not, um, given the need for uh, proper access to the hospital. We felt this was the best in the best interest of all uh, interested parties in the community to keep this project on hold until this um, pandemic settles down. The, the other thing is we've, we've, we've done this on other projects. The other two projects would be Geely Avenue. We're holding off as the water utility would need to get into in individual homes because we were going to be replacing lead water services. So that will be held for another 90 days, as well as the Badger Lofts project. <coughs> Uh, with that project, there was some water main that uh, was in dire need of being reconstructed. Nevertheless, um, it's one of the main feeds for the Rockline Corporation and with their uh, very important production of, of sanitary and, and uh, disposable disinfectant wipes, um, it was very important to keep that water flowing. So we're going to hold off on that project as well for another 90 days until this is uh, cleared up. Other, other areas that the public works um, has been mentioned is the parks have been closed. Uh, rentals, we've suspended rentals until May 15th, and uh, that was about approximately 45 cancellations that we refunded residents approximately is around $12,600 in, in park rental fees that we're going to be reimbursing those that unfortunately weren't unable to have their their celebrations at the parks during this time. We've had one sewer backup already as a result of wipes being flushed into the sewer system. Again, it is very important that uh, the wipes are not flushed, only flush toilet paper, please. And we have information on the city's website as well as our public works website uh, to have uh, further information to help people understand that. Our automated garbage uh, collection program we received our first shipment of carts today. They're being assembled. They're anticipated to be distributed next week for the first set, and they will be dropped off at the curbside or in front of your property. There will be no contact with individual households. And um, it, this is a very important subject as our garbage in the city of Sheboygan, as we mentioned, is manually collected, putting our employees and our collectors at serious exposure risk. So the timing is very important that this continues to get rolled out in order to, for protection of our employees as well as the public transferring bags to the curbside. 
the city staff um, is using proper protocol in terms of separating. We're not allowing individuals to ride in, in, in trucks together. So we're practicing our social distancing to keep staff and public works employees uh, available for, for this. Lastly, uh, a couple other, other concerns were um, the Wildwood Cemetery will be invoking some rules that are necessary in terms of family gatherings. Again, this is all part of the governor's uh, orders. So again, most of this information is on the city's website as well as our public works website. And I encourage uh, residents to continue to look at these sources for daily updates as this is um, constantly changing. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Next is uh, Vicki Schneider, the Acting Director of Human Resources and the Director of Senior Services for the City of Sheboygan. Um, as you know that we had um, had to close the Senior Center uh, relatively quickly in this process, so about three weeks ago. Uh, we have about 400 regular members that attend the Senior Center over the course of any uh, particular week. So it's a very active place and so we're concerned about the people who had used that as their, as their second home. Um, our staff, Rachel Connery and Melissa Wolf in particular, have continued to stay in touch with members through Facebook posts. If you haven't seen our website, our Facebook page, they're doing posts daily uh, with challenges, uh, exercise programs, things like that, to make sure that people stay um, connected. And they are also doing personal calls to members so that they can check in on people who, are, who have been our most regular our participants. Our newsletter had been sent out. Uh, they, we did put a notice on that that we will not obviously be able to fulfill that programming, but we will reschedule everything as best as we can. Um, and our staff continues to work through this in conjunction with the friends of the Senior Center that we're continuing to keep them whole by paying them to make sure that they stay connected to us as well. Um, I am also the acting Director of Human Resources for the past 13 days, but I'm not counting. Um, it's been an interesting experience and I'm really enjoying it, being able to work with the staff so that we can ensure that they too will be taken care of in this difficult time. Thank you very much, Vicki. Next is Derek Mink, the Director of Transit and Parking. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Shoreline Metro uh, has definitely had uh, a unique and trying uh, three weeks um, since this uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so thank you for allowing me to touch base on the changes. Um, our weekday fixed route service uh, is currently reduced uh, to 5.45 a.m. to 5.45 p.m. Uh, that's a three-hour reduction in the evenings and a four-hour uh, midday uh, reduction in service where we went to hourly service instead of half-hour service. Paratransit services uh, continue to mirror the hours and operations of fixed route. Saturday service is currently suspended. Uh, paratransit service remains uh, normal. Our fixed route customers are being uh, temporarily accommodated uh, to use the demand response service for essential and necessary trips uh, through our trip reservation uh, process. Fares are currently suspended for both services to reduce exposure to germs and viruses and to provide financial relief to our customers making essential trips during this difficult time. Fare media is temporarily unavailable to customers for purchase. Uh, temporary capacity constraints are in place with a limit of 10 individuals, including driver on fixed route buses and three on paratransit buses to ensure social distancing of six feet can be encouraged and maintained on the buses. We're also maintaining this uh, within office and office staff as well. The admin and maintenance facility is closed to customers, but our transfer station across from City Hall remains open weekdays, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The warming shelter at the transfer station is uh, also close to the public. Our customers must enter and exit through the rear doors on the fixed route service unless required or requesting to use the ramp or designated seats. Um, this is just a, a requirement to limit exposure and near contact with drivers. 
We are doing thorough cleaning of all of our buses, offices, and customer areas um, on, a, on a daily and weekly basis, utilizing drivers. Uh, we're also using drivers to clean bus shelters, facilities, and completing other projects essential to service, allowing us to do things um, in our buildings that we uh, haven't done in many, many years. Uh, our website, Facebook, and Bus Tracker app, uh, our technologies are all available to our customers during this time. Uh, we encourage our in, uh, individuals and our customers to review these daily for changes or updates to service. Uh, we update these as needed. Um, and just a note, uh, service levels may fluctuate based on driver availability and customer needs. We continue to monitor the situation and make decisions in the best interests of the health and wellness of our customers and employees. Um, we've, we've taken the, the steps to reduce service uh, due to a response in our drivers um, as far as their safety and wellness. The uh, response that we've gotten lately is that uh, most of our drivers um, are uh, feeling fairly confident in working and performing essential services, so we anticipate that their return to work uh, will be within the next week or two, um, which may prompt us to uh, return back to some sort of normal level of uh, transit service, but we will be making those decisions as uh, we have more uh, more information available from our employees. And lastly, just to update on parking utility, um, parking utility has des designated free parking spaces along A Street for customers picking up and dropping off at area residences and businesses. All other meters and parking lot fees remain as normal, and I do have just a sample of what the sign looks like. So it's a way to encourage individuals to support our businesses um, and be able to come downtown. Um, we designated some free meter stalls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Next is Marty Halverson, the Director of Finance and our Treasurer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so finance, obviously, as is for all of you, our, our top priority is everyone's health and safety. Um, and as a result, uh, beginning mid last week, uh, the finance department decided to separate its staff with two individuals remaining within City Hall's uh, finance department. Our purchasing agent is working from his county office space as he is a shared employee with the county. Um, and our remaining staff are all working remotely from home. Uh, this approach was taken not only to protect the individuals within the department, but also to protect the city. Should an exposure happen within City Hall, it would not render the entire finance department uh, out of commission. And, and certainly we, we want to continue to serve the residents and, and of the city of Sheboygan. Um, as a result, we do have our phone number listed on the city's website, so we are able to be reached uh, during operating hours. That main phone number is currently forwarded to one of the two individuals uh, staff in the uh, department so that they can properly uh, address the concern, question, or need and or route it to the other staff. Um, currently, I've also been collaborating with other municipalities, uh, namely finance uh, director up in Manitowoc. Uh, Steve Corbell and I have been discussing best practices and other ideas uh, on how we can get through this together. Uh, online payments continue to be an option for residents, both for ambulance and the municipal court. Uh, we also have our Dropbox, and we've communicated the location of that so that we are able to uh, frequently retrieve payments out of there, which we're doing uh, throughout the day. Uh, the U.S. mail continues to be our, our primary source of all of our documents, so we'll continue to monitor that the, the mail continues. Uh, should that change, then we'd put in alternate uh, arrangements. Um, we also, as you heard earlier from Director Beeble, we're looking at and constantly discussing the prioritization of projects as well as large purchases throughout the city. Uh, situations such as the delay of the Superior Avenue reconstruction are, are things that we have to consider, both not only from a feasibility uh, to, to accomplish the project, but also from a financing perspective. Uh, we are in contact uh, regularly with Wisconsin finance professionals, our uh, consultant who we utilize for our borrowing. The city is currently still on 
on its timeline for its, its borrowing in 2020. This is certainly done uh, and will be continuing up until that time frame. We'll be working with them to monitor the market and uh, certainly look at when it's advantageous for us to borrow to be able to make the necessary purchases to keep the city operational. And that is all that I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. Next is uh, Chris Domogowski, our Chief of Police. <clears throat> uh, good evening. Uh, so we've obviously started out with um, concentrating on updating both our hygiene and cleaning uh, protocols, close the lobby to, to keep citizens safe from getting too close inside there with each other. Um, because of um, our ability to, to do payments and things like that online, we've tried to get everybody um, to move to the phone. And so we've reassigned personnel, um, redone our phone system so that there's more lines that can provide service to, to citizens um, and moved all of that that way. Um, physically, we've done a bunch of things. We've moved about 20% of our personnel with the help of DPW, IT, and Chad Peleshek to the Social Security Building. Main purpose of that, again, is physical distancing and really to provide a backup workforce in case our main service um, through officers on the street becomes impacted by the virus. Um, we're currently in planning to go to a platoon system if, if needed. Many departments across the country have already done that. My concern with that is the substantial overtime costs that will come with that. Um, looking forward to what we're doing with the uh, detention center, the sheriff's office, and the judges um, as far as um, who we're taking to jail and pushing court dates off. Um, that's already going to impact us at, at some point, I think, on the overtime side. And so we're really trying to stay within the budget and only do those things necessary. But really every day planning is going on, um, both how, how we can adjust for what happens and plan for the future when, when this really resolves itself. Um, so every day um, planning is going on to adjust, adjust practices, talk to our partners and figure out um, the things that we need to do. We're also trying to use our social media sites as best we can to really to keep pushing information and sharing information from our partners. Thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, Fire Chief Eric Montanello. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Although we've tried to remain as much as possible to work and operate as business as usual, obviously there are certain uh, measures that we've taken to improve and, and, and look out for the safety of our staff. We've implemented policies that are in practice that are, are in coinc uh, coinciding with the Center for Disease Control guidelines. Uh, dispatch is currently screening the calls that come in for any COVID-19 uh, concerns, and that way they alert our staff members at a more, uh, you know, so they're more aware and, and can uh, take the necessary PPE precautions prior to arrival. Uh, we're requir requiring our crews to disinfect the ambulances and all our areas, patient care areas, as soon as possible. Uh, we're also um, requiring the crews actually to work every day to clean the stations. Uh, even though we've limited the visitation, the pub ed events, to station tours, and et cetera, we are trying to take every precaution we can to keep the stations clean. Some of our EMS protocols have changed as well to allow for our uh, COVID-related calls to be screened and increase the safety of our personnel and the patients as well. Uh, even uh, we've gone to measures of taking our temperatures day on a daily basis for our, our personnel that are on duty every day, uh, twice a day. Um, training has also been changed. We're, we're not doing as much training as, as a shift. We're trying to limit the exposure to each personnel, so we've uh, decreased the, the number of shift trainings. In fact, we're trying to work with the training officer right now to limit company trainings as well. Uh, we're working with the local 483 to try to look at best practices for our members and try to look out for the safety, and not only of the community we serve, but our personnel. Uh, as far as the COVID calls, since we've been tracking, we've had uh, approximately 
20 COVID related uh, calls uh, that we've responded to. Uh, however, only two of those have actually uh, resulted in, in a COVID related incident. Our current call volume is really on track. However, we're about 45 calls less than we were at this time last year. It could be just because of the isolation that everybody's doing, uh, social distancing and, and a lot of the businesses not being open that it's limited to a lot of the calls. So we'll see we, where we end up at the end of the year, but we're doing the best we can uh, to operate as best uh, as usual. Okay, thank you. Uh, Next is Assistant Chief Butler, who's been working with the uh, EOC. He's going to give you an update as well. Chuck. Thank you, Chief. Um, as of late, uh, with the Emergency Operations Center being opened, um, you're going to start to hear a lot of emergency operation jargon, um, things that we use behind the scenes in our preparedness activities and our uh, incident management structure. Um, tonight, I just want to take a second to give you a little bit of an update on uh, our Emergency Operations Center, um, what it is and what the folks there do. You, uh, is there a different slide or is there a slide? So <clears throat> the, the Emergency Operations Center is uh, right now uh, both a virtual and a physical location. Typically, it's a physical location, but given the circumstances of this response, um, we are actually, um, we're a little bit of both. Uh, we do meet. Um, and do some work uh, physically in a single location. But um, with the number of people that are involved, we're doing an awful lot of virtual work and everybody is getting much better at uh, using our, our phones and our conference systems and things like that. So we're doing an awful lot of work um, in a virtual manner right now. So the, uh, the EOC right now uh, and every EOC is made up of key stakeholders in the community. Um, those are uh, people from emergency response, people from business, in this case, uh, case a lot of folks from healthcare, uh, public health, um, and a, a lot of business leaders from the community are part of this operation, um, and along with su support staff for all of those individuals. And so really what the whole concept of the Emergency Operations Center is to put all of these folks in a uh, communication link and a forum and a, and, a, and a place where they can work together and share ideas and uh, make informed and very collaborative and cooperative decisions. Um, so another thing that they do is actually function in, uh, in times where there are scarce resources. And of course, right now, uh, we are in a situation where there are a lot of scarce resources and a lot of unknowns and a lot of questions that are coming. So um, these folks uh, that, that get together as a community um, they kind of work through some of those questions and they, and they prioritize some of those resources um, out to the community as they're best needed um, at the time they're needed. So, um, so our current EOC right now is actually, um, and that's the next slide, um, right now the city and the county are working together at the Emergency Operations Center supporting each other. Um, for a, a large event, of course, remember we talked, uh, the last time I was up here, we talked a little bit about the city not having a public health department. So this is a public health emergency. Uh, we are working primarily with the Sheboygan County EOC um, and supporting that operation. Uh, currently, the EOC is fully activated and all of the support areas are there and engaged. Um, it is a daily operation that occurs even through the weekend. Um, and uh, oftentimes, staff are working very late uh, from their homes and uh, planning for the next day. But um, we are using the incident command system. Um, and for those that don't understand that, it's basically a military structure. Uh, fire service uses it. It's become sort of the standard guideline for how to do things in an emergency. So everything stays organized, everything stays on track. Um, and it's really a, um, a system of best practices in managing events and uh, emergencies that have come down through the years. And uh, it's a little bit like best practice on steroids for an event like this. So um, it's very driven. Um, the structure is uh, very specific. We have very specific positions in place, very specific reports. Um, and uh, so the activities of the Emergency Operations Center, it's, a, it's really an ongoing cycle of activity. And it includes things like information gathering, uh, operations support and uh, daily briefings, uh, documentation of the event for long-term finance reasons and for resource 
um, supply, we forecast as best we can based on the information that's out there, and then we plan accordingly um, for the next operational period. And it just, it continues to keep driving uh, down that path um, to make sure that we're not missing anything, that we are doing everything we can looking forward, um, so we're not surprised any more than we would normally be surprised. Um, the EOC also uh, daily uh, develops an incident action plan for the day and that operational period. Um, that operational plan includes the updated uh, uh, daily objectives, our strategies for the day, and a general situational awareness of what's going on around us so we're all making decisions the same. Um, I talked a little bit about resource sharing and prioritization. Um, an example of that right now might be the PPE use. You know, everybody is looking for face masks, everybody's looking for gowns, everybody's looking for hand sanitizer. Well, rather than have it all stockpiled in one place, we share information between all the different organizations um, and we try to allocate those resources to the priority um, to make sure that everybody has what they need and then we kind of keep moving forward. A huge part of the uh, Emergency Operations Center right now is actually our joint information system. Um, and what that is, is basically an agreement between all of the cooperating parties that are involved in this response to say, look, we understand information is extremely important and there is so much out there. Um, so what we've agreed to do is once daily at one o'clock, we have a briefing that includes healthcare systems, um, administrators, um, businesses, all kinds of folks that have a, uh, an interest in this event and we get together um, and they, they sort of talk about the information, what are their core messages for their business or their um, organization, and that all gets compiled, and you've probably seen these come out. They come out at like three o'clock every day from Sheboygan County Public Health. Um, it is that uh, culmination of all of that work and that collaborative one source information um, thing that we try to point everybody to. And again, I would encourage everybody to go to Sheboygan County Public Health, um, their website, and look for those updates. Again, they come out like three o'clock, but they are the best, most accurate information up to date at that point. Um, so please try to avoid rumors, speculation, and all of the things that kind of come with that because it really gets people and uh, the hard workers at public health, you know, when they have to chase down a rumor that doesn't seem right, it takes more time off of their schedule. And uh, so try to go to those uh, vetted sources uh, if you could. Um, so really the whole idea of the, uh, the Emergency Operations Center, honestly, is to just maintain that updated situational awareness and uh, keep everybody on a common operating picture. That way when we're making decisions for this community, we're making them all with the same information, we're making them with everybody else in mind and we're doing it in a very cooperative way so we stay extremely efficient and we actually get through this together. Um, and really that is uh, the role of the EOC and the structure that's in place. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll move on to Joe Trueblood, the water utility superintendent. He'll join us remotely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Hofflin, and the council members. <clears throat> I wanted to begin just by reassuring and reminding everyone that COVID-19 is not transmitted by drinking water. Municipal water is safe. Um, there is no need to stockpile bottled water uh, or anything like that. Um, the core mission of the water utility is to provide safe drinking water to the community. That includes Sheboygan, Sheboygan Falls, and the village of Kohler. And that's what we're focused on during this emergency. Uh, in order to do that, we need the water treatment plant in, in full operation. And that relies on a fairly small number of staff members who are uh, experienced, knowledgeable, and expert in, in operating that plant. So very early in this process, we closed off the treatment plant and uh, only our operational personnel are allowed to go in there uh, just simply as a means of isolation as we've heard with some other uh, of my colleagues. So those folks are pretty much sealed off from the rest of us at the Wadi utility and we'll continue to do that until we're through this um, health emergency. And that includes packages. Anything going in is, is doused in disinfectant. And we're really treating that uh, water treatment plant as a, a safe zone of protection. Um, the other aspects of, of what we're maintaining during the emergency are, are essential as well. Uh, we uh, uh, have to operate the water distribution system. We have to re respond to any main breaks or problems uh, getting water to where it needs to go. 
And in order to do that, we've uh, taken a team approach. So we've taken our uh, construction maintenance crew and we've put them into smaller teams, again, just to isolate. And again, as, uh, as Chief Domogowski mentioned, trying to put staff in different places. So if one does become ill or quarantined, that we're not taking out a number of other staff members. Um, in our office, uh, facility as well we are we are staff we're answering phones that come in we still have a lot of customer service issues water supply issues um, during the weekday the the phone calls will be answered there there may be times where a, a person may have to come back come back and call a little later uh, but we are still staffing our phone lines and, and prov providing all of that customer service as normal uh, we are collecting meter readings out in the field. That's uh, good work in, in isolation for our staff to do. Uh, we are uh, producing municipal billings, water, sewer, garbage fee billings, and we'll be sending those out. Uh, however, there is no late fee. There is no uh, disconnection process. All of those kind of uh, collection uh, devices have been suspended during the emergency uh, as well. And I think... Um, uh, we've also moved about half our staff onto remote platforms, things like engineering. Um, some of our other customer service folks are able to work remotely, uh, our supervisory staff, and uh, about half our staff are able to do remote work. So we're in very good shape. We've actually quarantined some people that were in the Milwaukee area. We've taken a very aggressive approach. We don't want uh, the virus to get into the water utility. If it does, we're going to do everything we can to minimize its impact. And each week uh, we're, we're taking another look, as, as everybody is, at this dynamic situation, making adjustments. And uh, I think at the time being, we're, we're in good condition at the water utility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Next is Garrett Erickson, uh, director of the Mead Public Library. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the library's been closed since March 18th, uh, a couple weeks ago. And normally when you come to the library, there's lots of different things that you can do as a resident. Check out books, attend programs, use a meeting space. Uh, we fill a lot of informational needs and so on. So we have had to limit what we offer, but we are still offering services. Um, the biggest of which is our digital resources. So we've got a lot available for people if they come onto the library's website. If you want to learn a new language or do consumer reports, Ancestry.com, New York Times, those are the sorts of things that we have offered for people to come. And we've actually seen approximately about a doubling in the usage of uh, these don online resources during this first month of, this, uh, of the virus. Uh, we also offer, still offer research for people if they want to call up, people that work uh, normally on our second floor. So if you have an informational question, please just send the library either a, a phone message or an email and we'll get back to you. Uh, our librarians are working from at home right now and are answering all their questions that they normally would. Uh, we are also in the process of moving all of our access points in the building to the perimeter so that uh, hopefully the weather warms up and people can um, come outside of the library during the day and they can still access our wireless service. We have a tremendous number of people that depend on us uh, for wireless that don't have it at home. And then finally, uh, we are learning how to use online learning platforms like the schools. So we're offering uh, online book clubs and story times and things like that um, as best we can to try and make this just sort of a normal for people. Um, if they want to connect through us online, they can. So that's what, that's what we've been working on at the library. Thank you very much, Garrett. Next is Meredith De Bruin, our city clerk. You can do it right there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Although we have many duties in the clerk's office, I think our, the thing that's been impacted the most has been the election. Um, the election is still a go as of um, today for April 7th. Um, our mission in the clerk's office is to have any eligible voter who wishes to vote, vote and have that vote counted. And we want to do that. We need to do that in a safe environment. So what we've been doing is encouraging people to vote by mail. That is the best way to do it. Um, many people are going to the My Vote site, which is myvote.wi.gov, to request a ballot. Um, we are fielding many phone calls in our office. Many times all four lines are busy as we're helping people navigate that system that they've never used before. 
Um, right now, we have had over 6,000 ballots issued. Um, to kind of put that in perspective, um, April of 16, we had about 1,500 absentee ballots requested and sent, and in November, which was the last presidential, we had about 5,200. So we're well over that, and we keep seeing about two to 300 a day. So that has been really what we've been working on in our office besides the phone calls. Um, that being said, since the election is a go, um, we need to staff our polls on election day, which is next Tuesday. Um, usually for an April election, we have 100 plus poll workers. Right now, we're down to about 85. Um, the state just sent some clarification out today asking that people over the age of 65 or with underlying health conditions that are considered more of risk um, should not be poll workers. Um, so the underlying conditions they have included are chronic lung disease, moderate to severe asthma, serious heart conditions, immunocompromised status, which means poorly controlled HIV or AIDS or cancer patients and pregnant women. So those people are better off to stay home. Um, we have had some outreach from city workers, which has been wonderful. Um, I talked to somebody at Lakeland today and um, the Sheboygan Area School District. So we are helping to fill those spots. We are taping a training session, an hour training session. We're gonna be doing that tomorrow and sending the link out to people who want to be poll workers on election day. Um, the polls, we, we have eight polling locations. Um, we have had to move two of those due to um, churches that just weren't comfortable having us there on election day. So we moved EV Free to City Hall, which are wards five through 10. And we also moved First United Lutheran, which is 16, 17, and 18, to the police department. Some of the things that we're doing at the polls are signage. Um, the state has sent us some signs that we can post um, talking about um, not to enter the building if you're feeling sick, that we can do curbside voting. Um, we, I've been working with DPW. We've ordered eight hand washing stations, so there'll be a hand washing station at each poll as well as um, hand sanitizer and bathrooms to wash up. Um, we have a multitude of pens that we will ask people to use a pen and then have them sanitized. So take a pen when you come, use it throughout the process and drop it off to be sanitized. Um, the floors are gonna be marked. Um, we had some guidance about how to do photo IDs by putting, which we started in our office actually because we're doing in-person absentee is marking off a spot for them to put down their photo ID and then stepping back that six feet and then coming up to sign the poll books, but again, stepping back that six feet. Um, we have magnifying glasses for people that it, it's those, those IDs are really hard to see, little writing, so we have magnifying glasses to see them better. Um, we also do have some disposable gloves and um, some face masks, but they aren't the 95s. Um, so we also had a call from somebody who's a new poll worker who has agreed, she asked if she could make some for our poll workers. So we will have those available as well. Um, we're still encouraging people to vote um, by mail. They can vote up until April 2nd if they're a regular voter. And then in person in our office, we are still doing that 8 to 4.30 this week. Um, if voters are concerned about their mallets getting back to our office by mail, we have a drop box on 9th Street right outside of City Hall that we are checking daily and we will get their ballot counted and to the polls on election day. That's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the work you and your staff are doing to get ready for this. That'll conclude our, our uh, city reports. Next, we'll go on to our community leader reports and we'll start out with uh, Joe Sheehan, the executive director of the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. Joe is joining us remotely. Joe, are you there? We seem to be missing Joe, so we'll go on uh, to the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce and Executive Director Deidre Martinez is gonna join us. Deidre? Yes, hello, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for having me. The uh, Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce has uh, certainly had to transition how we operate. Um, our office is closed to the public and my team is working remotely. 
Um, but they are working and probably more than they ever have before. Thankfully, with uh, modern technology, we were able to transition all of, um, all of our needs to our homes. So we're still fielding phone calls. Um, we have actually been uh, inundated with phone calls. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. And, you know, the business community as well as the community at large um, you know, looks at us as a trusted source, which uh, we take that responsibility very seriously. So um, with that being said, some of the things that we have um, done it, at my office is really spent a significant amount of time researching and studying um, the emergency response legislation um, and subject, ma you know, working with subject matter experts so that we can share that understanding with businesses and guide them through this process. Um, with everything flying at us so quickly, um, it, you know, creates um, anxiety and uncertainty and fear and, um, you know, a, a feeling of I just don't know where to begin. So uh, we put together the Small Business Owners Guide to Relief Programs in the CARES Act um, in conjunction with some of our board members as well as legal counsel. Um, we are working closely with uh, the county and, of course, Division of Public Health. We want to ensure that any information that um, we are making available to our members and non-members alike is verified, is clear and concise information. Um, and we encourage other like organizations throughout Sheboygan County to utilize the information that we're preparing so that we can take that burden off of them. Um, we are providing a number of web-based professional development opportunities, um, answering questions, providing guidance, and allowing for a safe space for business owners to connect. We recently launched an economic impact survey throughout Sheboygan County, and of, of our respondents, we see um, that there's a significant amount of uh, businesses, primarily small businesses at this time, um, that have either had to shut their doors completely um, in order to, of course, keep the community safe, but, um, but others that can be open have had to limit their hours due to just lack of um, customers. So, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are making ourselves available to our, our businesses, especially small businesses during this time. And we've really kind of opened our reach to include non-chamber member businesses as well. Um, we understand that in order for in the long term, um, you know, for our community to recover and get to where we need to be, we need to be supporting all businesses. And so, uh, you know, the members and board members have um, accepted that challenge and, um, you know, we're open to it. So through that, we are supporting businesses that have remained open, whether it be restaurants, with um, takeout or delivery um, options and we have a dedicated website that we are updating in real time um, as things change. We have created a page on our website to also um, break down the different uh, business resources available. So whether you're an employer and you've had to lay off your staff and now you want to give them as the best guidance on unemployment, um, the links can be found right on our website to take them to the places they need to be. Um, or if you're a business owner and you are attempting to um, understand what the CARES Act means for you, we have um, resources for that. If you're looking to uh, apply for small business loans or grant opportunities um, that information is available it's become really a one-stop shop and then of course um, most importantly from the healthcare perspective um, working you know updating the division of public health information as they um, send it to us and making sure that our our folks are getting what's current what's real um, information for our county and then we also have wonderful partnerships with both Prevea Health and Aurora, and we've had an opportunity to do some online uh, virtual meetings with Dr. Rai of Prevea Health, just talking about, talking through, um, you know, some of what's happening in healthcare with COVID-19, how to keep ourselves, our families, our employees safe, and um, an opportunity to ask questions as well. And we find that 
you know, when, um, when there's so much uncertainty and we need, uh, we need to create a calm and sometimes just having that conversation and being available to answer questions or making subject matter experts available to answer questions of our public as well as our business owners um, is really a, a strong and positive way to do things. Um, and of course, you know, working with um, organizations like the SCEDC, Joe and I spend a lot of time communicating um, as well as other chambers of commerce throughout the county, um, local municipalities, the county itself. So really just making sure that, um, you know, at the higher level, you know, we're all communicating, we're all expressing um, the things that we see happening in our respective areas so that we can create a, a strong, successful plan um, for what this looks like in the long term. You know, the initial impact is um, scary, and we know that. And, and I'm not going to tell anyone they shouldn't be afraid um, because that's a real feeling. But in the long term, we got this, and Sheboygan County is steadfast, and it rallies. Um, and so if we continue to work together the way that we have and empowering our businesses and our leadership, we will absolutely be successful. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for that update, Deidre. Uh, next, uh, we're going to call on Natasha Torrey, uh, is our judge for the uh, Sheboygan and Kohler Municipal Court. Natasha is joining us remotely. Natasha, can you bring your sound up a little bit? The lobby is open, and the clerks are staffing it, and that is available by phone and by email. And we have updated our website to provide contact information for them as well. We um, were, unfortunately, in a position where we had to cancel all of our trials and initial appearances for late March and then all of April, and those are scheduled for May or later, and now we're in the process of figuring out how to schedule those um, via telephone or um, video if it becomes necessary for us to continue to not have in-person court. Uh, in Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, next, we'll move on to Kate Bear. Kate Bear is joining us remotely. Kate? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Kate, go ahead. Okay, hold on. Let me just... I had you on speaker. So, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, really excited to take this opportunity to give you an update about the social sector in Sheboygan County and United Way. So, we are also, I echo the gratitude I hear in tonight's um, meeting in regards to just being so thankful for all of our community members, businesses, and government to unite together to answer the needs of our friends, family, coworkers, neighbors in need. Um, United Way continues to respond to our community's evolving needs through um, a number of different avenues. We have a nonprofit response network that we've convened. There's um, our volunteer center that has both volunteer center opportunities and wish list um, opportunities for nonprofits to post tangible items. We are also kind of collecting and gathering the most up-to-date resources, working in conjunction with um, the chamber, SCDC, public health, um, all those great avenues. And we have implemented a Sheboygan County COVID-19 relief fund. So I'll quickly kind of speak to what we're doing in each of those areas um, regarding the initial and ongoing response. Um, <clears throat> it's been interesting navigating these unchartered waters, as you all know. Um, we actually sent out a needs assessment survey to all nonprofit agencies and social sector serving orgs. Um, I think that was Friday, March 13th. Um, I just have the utmost respect and appreciation for my staff and board who rallied to the challenge and like many of you working long hours to make sure that we can be of best support in our community during this trying time. Um, we initially hosted two conference calls to gather more of a needs assessment around what's happening with our nonprofit friends as well as um, did the actual assessment survey. Um, <clears throat> 
So we are, of course, encouraging local nonprofits to think differently, as we all are, about how they can fulfill their current needs. Um, nonprofits are collaborating and partnering, um, problem solving in new ways, which has been so exciting to be a part of that. And we're also hopeful that the CARES Act will be of support to local nonprofits um, because of the increased cost, loss of revenue for many organizations, which is a frightening recipe, as we all know, and very it's deeply concerning. Um, so we're continuing to convene these weekly calls um, with nonprofits and social sector serving organizations. So all sorts of folks kind of come to the table every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Everything I'm referencing is on our website, uwofc.org. Um, so definitely just go to the website. We have a ton of information. Um, what you would expect and anticipate for needs that we keep hearing is around basic needs assistance, right? So food access and security, transportation to food sites, childcare, rental and utility assistance. Um, also, of course, and lots of concern around lots of revenue during the safer at home process, um, layoffs to their own staff, um, impacts to operation and program changes. And then um, I'll explain a little bit how the fund is responding to these needs, um, but just a quick lead update on the volunteer aspect. So obviously anticipating volunteer needs changing, um, we have an area on our volunteer website that is specific to COVID-19 pandemic opportunities. Um, and also this wish list specific, but as we motivate healthy community members to volunteer, continued health and safety for them is our top priority. Um, it's a constant reminder. We're able to share out different information we get from public health and from CDC around you know, health and safety protocols, for volunteering, what that looks like. A lot of folks have had to change, obviously, their their way in which they're utilizing their volunteers. Um, and so then the Sheboygan County COVID-19 Relief Fund, really excited and, again, proud that we were one of the first United Ways to implement this in the in the state of Wisconsin, acting fast upon those school closures and, and working, working really hard. So the function of this local relief fund is to provide resources to nonprofit organizations that directly support community members who are disproportionately impacted by coronavirus. 100% um, of the funds raised go directly to the Sheboygan County Fund and United Way is absorbing all internal and administrative costs, um, financing any of the online platform fees. Uh, we were able to initially just kind of seed this fund with $10,000. We have raised, um, we have raised to date around 70000 almost $70,000, but we've had requests for over $87,000. And so we really um, are calling upon the community to if a person or business is in any sort of position to give, every little bit matters, every little bit counts. These nonprofits are in need. Um, we have granted out for phase one right now, because this fund is really two phase. So uh, multiple phases of funding are anticipated because of both acute needs and then these longer term impacts. And the primary goal of phase one is to help meet basic needs and increase that resiliency um, that our community members are impacted by. And then the second phase will kind of look at returning the local social sector back to normal as quickly as possible so that organizations can continue to serve. Um, so we have granted for that phase one um, over 30, 32000 I think, around $32,000 to date. Um, and again, though, we receive inquiries daily around this fund, and our board and um, leadership team are meeting every other day to kind of go through applications, continue the plan of raising funds. Um, because we find ourselves in a critical position, um, community support and financial resources are urgently needed. So again, if anyone would like to donate to this fund, I would happily take this opportunity to say, visit our website, uwofsc.org, um, and continue to help us kind of meet the needs of our local nonprofits and those we serve. Um, we also have a community uh, 
resource COVID-19 specific resource card that we've been working with um, cross-sector folks on and that should be available very soon. And we continue to reach out cross-sector as everyone else has mentioned prior to this to kind of figure out ways in which we can coordinate and collaborate around helping the public. So I just um, echo that I believe that you are all such a bright light um, during these dark trying times and that humanity is shining in different ways, even though this is incredibly um, scary and concerning. We, we really shine as a county and I'm so proud to work alongside all of you. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, next uh, is Sheboygan County. Uh, Sheboygan is, County has been a great partner for the city and really has, uh, you know, led this effort with the COVID-19 response. And I'd like to call up Adam Payne, the county administrator, to introduce his team and uh, look forward to their report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Common Council. Uh, thank you, Daryl Hofflin and all the members of the city's team for your leadership during this time and the tremendous collaboration we have between the city of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County, it is appreciated. And we appreciate being able to share a little bit about what's in play. These are just extraordinary times, absolutely extraordinary times. <clears throat> um, it's heartening to hear the, 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 the updates and everyone's involvement and engagement. It is all hands on deck in this community and it's certainly all hands on deck in Sheboygan County. I think of just how quickly the information has changed. It just keeps coming at us so, so fast. And those of us at the county uh, that are really engaged, such as our emergency management director and public health and others, it, it's really been all consuming the last three or four weeks without question. Um, for me personally, it's just remarkable that how much can change in two or three weeks I mean, we went from hearing limiting non-essential gatherings to over 1,000 to 250 to 50 to 10 in less than a week. On March 12th, Governor Evers declared the public emergency. March 12th, on March 17th, he came out with another emergency order. On that day, the county board also met and declared a state of emergency in Sheboygan County, which provided emergency powers to the county board chair and myself to, to provide whatever necessary resources we need to protect the health and safety and welfare of the community. That day, on March 17th, the state of Wisconsin had 72 confirmed cases. And of course today, less than two weeks later, it's 1,221. Uh, on the 17th, we had four confirmed cases in Sheboygan County, and, and today it's 10. It is just remarkable to me how quickly information is coming at us and how quickly it's changing. You recall when the governor closed down the schools, what an impact that had on the city of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County. Just our, our workforce alone, yet alone the community as a whole. And before that day came and went, the schools, some of the districts closed even more quickly. So we had such limited time to, to work with them. And then on March 20th, the governor updated his mass gathering ban and ordered closure, as we know, of all non-essential businesses. 24th, the safe at home order, which really was further clarification of what he put in his original order. But suffice it to say, it has been a whirlwind of activity and just remarkable times for all of us. In Sheboygan County, uh, we have tremendous people on our team. And we all know you learn so much about one another during tough times, don't you? We learned about one another's character and how we step up to situations like this, and everyone's different. But uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of our team. As you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, with me today is our Emergency Management Director, Steve Steinhardt. I think I've known Steve for nearly 20 years, and he has always been a cool, informed customer, a good leader, and I've been so impressed with his steady leadership. Um, star is aptly named our public health officer. She has truly been a star during this trying times. Our sheriff, Corey Raisler, of course, is very engaged. He shut down the correctional facility to visitors right away. Our health and human services director, Matt Stripmotter, who obviously works with star and our public health information officer, uh, Libby Jacobs, all hands on deck. They're our purchasing agent that uh, we've been sharing for some time, uh, Bernie Romer has been outstanding and 
turning over every rock and looking for every opportunity to get additional masks or gloves or gowns or whatever personal protective equipment we need, not only for Rocky Knoll, but people throughout this community. And he, he's been tremendous. As was mentioned by Chuck, we have this pandemic plan, this an administrative panel, and, and it's nice to see the community come together and see the representation. Of course, Chuck's the leader on that. Mayor, you're involved. City administrators involved. Uh, all of our uh, community leaders, including our hospital representatives and, and clinic folks are involved. I had a chance to talk to Dave Grabner, the Aurora president, later this earlier this afternoon, and really heartened with the planning that the hospital, Aurora in particular, is doing in preparation for this. It is truly all hands on deck. Our HR director, Dennis Miller, I think he started about the same time Vicki did a few weeks ago. Talk about getting thrown into the fire when you have 850 employees at Sheboygan County. They are looking for guidance just as your employees at the city are. And government, as you know, is exempt from the governor's orders. We have essential programs and services. So what does that look like? And who, what are the essential functions? Who can work from home? We've been doing the best we can to provide weekly routine information. We have about 130 employees working at home if they can, but most of our employees continue to work at law enforcement, health and human services, Rocky Knoll. We have many, many essential functions and we continue to be open for business and to serve the community. Our corporation council, Crystal Fieber, has been rock solid. Our IT director, Chris Lewinsky, all these committee meetings, including this meeting today and doing as much as we can online or, or through, what is it called, Zoom? Is that the, the buzzword right now that everyone's using to stay in contact? We've made so many adjustments with our standing committees, as I know the city has as well. So we appreciate our IT director and their office support. And then Rocky Knoll. Oh, this is near and dear to me. My wife's a registered nurse. My two daughters are health professionals. It is so critically important that our emergency responders and healthcare professionals get the resources they need. Every patient they interact with, they're taking a risk. And for me personally, that's been one of the areas where I've been very engaged working, in fact, with Mayor Vandersteen. We had a uh, discussion with the governor last week about making sure that we're getting those supply chains here and that our county emergency management director is the key contact so we know what's coming from these stockpiles, who's ordering it, when it's arriving, who has what, because how do we establish priorities? How do we distribute limited resources if we don't know who has what and where those needs are? But again, Steve, Bernie, and all involved have been doing an outstanding job. And finally, I'll end with, you know, the county's been doing our best to promote social distancing. As I said, those employees that can are working from home. We've encouraged the public, and for those that are watching this or listening to this, please, if you don't have to come to a county facility, don't call ahead, email, make an appointment, be mindful of coming to county facilities for your own good health and our employees' good health. Uh, there's often other means where we can provide service, whether it's a simple phone call. Uh, so again, we're open, but we're hoping people will be mindful about coming to the county administration building or courthouse. We have restricted access at our Rocky Knoll nursing home, just as all nursing homes have now for obvious reasons to protect our residents. We were one of the first in the region actually to do that. And we hope that, uh, we're able to continue to protect our residents, but of course you never know when that might come in the door, whether it's an employee or anyone else. So in summary, I'm so proud of our team at Sheboygan County. I'm really proud of this community and how everyone is stepping up and doing what they can to be part of the solution. Um, cooler heads prevail. My dad used to always say that to me and it's so important that we all remain calm and mindful, yet with some urgency. We're fortunate that unlike some parts of the country, we have more time to prepare and make preparations and we need to take advantage of this time. Uh, check on your neighbors. Maybe that was said with one of the earlier presentations, but I don't think it can be emphasized enough that there's a lot of people who can't get to the grocery store or are afraid to go to the grocery store. Check on your friends and neighbors, especially if you have elderly people in your neighborhood and make sure they're okay. And finally, Thank your health care providers and your emergency responders and the folks at the grocery store and stocking the shelves. Be patient with them. Be grateful 
for the good work they're doing and how important they are to our overall success. So again, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for this opportunity and our emergency management, Steve Steinhardt, would then take the podium if that's okay yep. with you. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, city council members. I wanna start out by first giving everybody, or at least Chuck Butler, a huge thank you. Chuck has come into our EOC, integrated with the facility, just at a running pace. Um, I have known Chuck again pretty much for 20 years now, as long as I've been emergency management director. And like this virus that we have, we're dealing with right now, most emergencies don't know boundaries. So when something comes up, whether it be in the city of Sheboygan or whether it be somewhere in Cas like Cascade, I know I can call Chuck and he'll be there because again, emergencies know no boundaries and having another person with me is just, it's a godsend. So that's how I want to start. Um, again, because Chuck is integrated into our EOC along with STAR, when we, we're coming here today, I, we kind of divide to conquer kind of a thing, so we weren't going to talk about the same things. So I'm kind of going to go off on a little bit of a tangent on some of the things we could do. There's a PowerPoint if you could. Adam had brought up how things are changing continuously. Right now, the information is at a flow like it's trying to drink water from a fire hose. And that is true with it, except for two things, and a lot of people have brought this up. Wash your hands, social distancing. That has been said from the outset of this epidemic or pandemic. And it's been said and it's still said because it's true. If your hands don't hurt right now a little bit, if they're not a little chapped, a little sore, you're probably not doing it enough. Mine hurt because I'm washing my hands all the time. Um, there are things we still should do for our community because we don't want to lose out on our community. This is a, excuse me, sir. This is Star's little chunk. There we go, go back one. There we go. But there are still things we need to do for our community. Even though we are social distancing, even though we are staying at home to the extent practical and right, we still have to go to the store probably once a week and pick something up. And I say once a week is probably the max you should be doing. But if you're there, maybe just pick up a few extra things for the local food bank. Now is the time when people need that probably most due to all the unemployment we're gonna see. They need help, and it's up to us to pick each other up. Um, also, blood donations. Just because we're having an, a pandemic doesn't mean emergency surgery stop. People having heart attacks, people in a car accident, people need blood. Elective surgeries may have been stopped, but emergencies still happen. We need to help our friends and neighbors. Adam touched on this. But call your friends and neighbors and relatives. Uh, this past weekend, I spent a good time in my office just calling and checking on people. And literally, people, what should have been a 30-second conversation would go on 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And it had little to do with why they called. They just needed to talk to someone. And not about COVID. They just needed to talk. So check on your friends and neighbors and loved ones. Um, boost your immune system. A lot of people are getting starting to run ragged. Make sure you get enough sleep. Take care of yourself. Get some exercise. You can go outside to get some exercise. Don't do it in groups of 10, 50, 20. Don't do group yoga, but you can get outside and go for a walk. Eat a well-balanced diet. I sure hope that people aren't drinking as much as they say they are on social media, because that seems like a lot. Um, take care of yourself. Uh, next slide. Stay informed with good information. Avoid spreading rumors. It's been said already, but I can't tell it, say it enough. If the number of people that called in saying they know someone that is positive for co coronavirus to the EOC was true, a good chunk of Sheboygan would have coronavirus. Um, and a lot of these are coming from what I would consider very trusted sources. People that typically, if I heard them tell me something, I would trust it. We're getting a lot of bad information right now. So unless it's something that you specifically know from directly from a source, don't repeat it. If you don't know it's absolutely true, don't repeat it. Like I tell my mom, 
Just because it's on Facebook or the internet doesn't make it true. Watch the news in moderation. People need to be informed. People are getting consumed by this though. Stay informed. The best way to stay informed is our county public health website. That is the news directly from the, from the source, from the people that are getting the test results back from the state. They know before anyone else knows. So if you really wanna know what's going on, focus on our local public health department. I want to touch a little bit about Code Red. Code Red is an emergency mass notification system the county had purchased uh, in February. Due to timing, it didn't kind of roll out the way I wanted it because I didn't want to create some panic in the community of doing a test call. We gave it some long thought and decided we still needed to do a test call to make sure the system works. So we did our test call on Thursday, March 26, around one in the afternoon. I'm hoping most of you people got it. Again, this is a system that allows us to notify the public via a phone call, a text message, or an email if there's an emergency in their neighborhood. We have some basic information on most people already in the system. So part of this test call included information, and again, my apologies to the lady who recorded the message spoke a little too fast, but if you have other means of getting a message, such as a cell phone or an email that you would like that information on, go to the Sheboygan County website, which is www.sheboygancounty.com. At the bottom of the page is a link where you could sign up to modify your own information to make sure you're getting the messages. Um, you can also go and, there's a couple, of you can also text to enroll, and that number is on the next slide. So there's multiple ways to get the messages. Uh, I wanted to make sure that the citizens of Sheboygan knew it was out there, know it's a mass notification system, and know it's primarily going to be used in emergencies. We're not going to tell you that the fire department's having a brat fry. It's going to be when something needs to, when you need to take action for a specific event like a gas leak or a chemical spill. So I want to make sure the public knew about that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Steve. And this, next, I'd like to bring up uh, Starlene Grossman. Please come to the podium and let us know what's happening in your EOC. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, everyone, for um, all your support as we've been going through this process. It's been a long couple of weeks, um, but we are um, we feel very blessed to be part of this community, and Sheboygan County Public Health is uh, doing hard work to make sure that everyone in our community is safe and healthy. Um, as Adam kind of laid out a timeline of what we've been experiencing here, things are changing very quickly. Um, as of today, we do have 10 confirmed cases within Sheboygan County, and so what that means for public health is that we are doing... Um, We've started our contact tracing. So contact tracing means that we are following up with every confirmed case of COVID-19. And we um, ask them a lot of questions about when they became sick, um, how long that they've had the symptoms. And we go back um, two days prior to symptom onset and um, ask about anybody that they'd been in contact with during that time period and then follow up with all of those persons um, to let them know that they should um, isolate or quarantine at home uh, for 14 days post exposure to make sure that in case they do become ill after being exposed to the illness that they don't spread it further in our community. So we're doing a lot of contact tracing right now, a lot of conversations with a lot of people. Um, we're also issuing isolation and quarantine orders. So isolation is where um, if you have someone that's ill, you ask them to stay home and, and stay away from other people. And quarantine would be if you were exposed to someone who was ill, we ask you to stay home even though you're well to make sure that if you do become ill in the future that you don't spread the illness. So we're doing that. Um, we're also working closely with our healthcare providers to make sure that they have the most current recommendations related to testing and the testing guidelines from the state. Uh, the state of Wisconsin uh, uh, State Lab of Hygiene um, has issued updates to their testing guidance as of the 25th, I believe, was the most current ones that came out. So we're trying to make sure that healthcare providers are aware of who they should be testing um, and what that testing process looks like. 
working with our healthcare providers also to better understand their uh, lab capacity and what tests are being done and where they're going so that we can be aware of the results as they come in in real time and get started on those contact investigations as quickly as possible. Um, we also do a lot of information sharing. So we have a long-term care facility, um, small group that's gonna be meeting weekly to just talk about what long-term care are experiencing and what their needs are and um, be uh, very intentional about making sure that that high-risk vulnerable population has the, the workers in those environments have the things that they need to successfully um, stop the illness from spreading should it be introduced into a long-term care facility setting. And then we are meeting with our healthcare provider systems daily um, to just check in to see where they're at, to see what kinds of um, testing that they're doing, um, if they're seeing a lot of increases in ICU beds or the use of ICU beds. So we've been um, keeping up to date with that. And then we also have our uh, daily communications calls that happen at one o'clock every day. So um, public health has been certainly been very busy, but we uh, appreciate all of the support that we are getting from our community. And um, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now that we've concluded with the presentations, we'll open it up for any questions. Alderperson Sorensen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you everybody for uh, presenting uh, what everybody is doing. I do just wanna say thank you so much for making sure that our meeting is safe, um, making sure we're practicing social distance, um, as well as making sure that our space is clean. Um, so per usual, I do have a few questions. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll just ask my questions for, for those individuals. Um, Star, you just spoke, so I, I have some for you too. Thanks again for coming. Um, wherever is comfortable for you. Um, so you mentioned uh, testing just in the community. Um, um, I'm, I'm curious more about what, what that process looks like um, for, for individuals in Sheboygan County. Um, I know the, the Sheboygan Press um, did an article about if folks feel that they've been symptomatic, what their process um, should be. Um, what's the average timeline that we're seeing in our community um, for individuals to get access to a test, and then once they do get a test, how long does that take until that test result comes back? Sure, those are good questions. So yeah. the um, access to testing, um, there, if you look at our daily updates, every health system has a little bit different way that they're funneling people into access for testing. Testing does require a doctor's order. So most systems have a triage process or all systems have a triage process where people can call and go through their symptoms, go through their history, and then the healthcare provider is making the, the decision based off of DHS guidelines related to who they're able to test. Um, right now, the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene is prioritizing testing for people who are um, critically ill in ICU or hospitalized, healthcare workers in long-term care, or those who live in like congregate settings like CBRFs and things like that. Okay. So those are the top tier that we're looking at testing. Um, and those, get, those tests get priority. So when, I'm, when you're talking about how long does it take to get test results back, it varies a lot based off of where, the, where people fall on that priority testing list. So people who are in those top tiers, their test is gonna be prioritized and um, will be run more quickly than um, folks that are maybe in, top, in tier three or four for the testing categories from the state. Um, and so uh, tier one, tier two testing is usually coming back within 48 hours. Okay. Um, and then the tier three, four could take longer. I've heard of it taking, or I've seen it take up to a week or more. Okay, and what, what are we generally seeing in our community? A lot of the testing that's being done right now is in those tier one, tier two. Okay. Um, I did think I jotted down another question here. So um, I think this week we've seen a lot of what's going on um, like in New York and um, in Washington State. Um, and there's um, some numbers and information coming out um, the last few days that the peak that Wisconsin will have will be, you know, late April, early May-ish. What, what is the sense from, from the folks that you're communicating with? And, and this is open to Chuck too as well. I'm another folks on the EO, um, EOS um, team. Um, it, in terms of how prepared is our community, do, do our hotels have enough ICU beds? Are we short on ventilators in the state, in our community? What's our capacity um, to handle that once we hit that peak? And what, what, what is your, 
what, what's your sort of expert um, opinion on what that peak and, and uh, will look like for our community once we hit that? Is, is our community ready for that right now? Where are the gaps? How can the city help fill those gaps? So I, that's I, a very, I know, very yeah, that's general a question. Very but, um, large yeah. question. Um, so I'll try my best to answer it as best I can. Um, we are collaborating uh, fairly, uh, very well with our healthcare providers, and both health systems are working um, diligently on preparing their surge plans. So those surge plans include um, what to do or what their plans are if they, if we start seeing more cases showing up that need to be um, in the ICU or need ventilators. Um, right now, uh, um, after our administrative panel meeting this morning, we learned that um, both of our hospital systems. Um, do not have any persons that are in their ICU that are suspect of COVID or for COVID at this time as of this morning, and that um, uh, none of the ventilators are currently in use within our community. Uh, both health systems did kind of share the, the systems themselves. So Aurora is a, a large system that's spread across the region, and St. Nicholas also um, is regional, has some regional ties. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so those systems, um, so if we said that we had 14 ventilators, I think, was the number from this morning. I don't know, remember the exact number. Um, 14 ventilators in our community. Uh, Aurora System could say, well, we're not using any in Sheboygan right now, but they need them in Grafton and pull ventilators there. And then if we would need them in Sheboygan, then they might come back. So it's, it's kind of um, in flux based off of what the needs are um, within the Aurora System or within the St. Nicholas System. But I would say that both of our health systems are diligently preparing and um, have plans in place for how to manage the surge if, um, if we see a large one here in our Follow community. Follow question to that. Okay. Uh, are there difficulties, so you say our healthcare providers, they're preparing, are there difficulties at getting equipment or getting those necessary items right now? So um, both health systems have, um, are, uh, have applied for SNS, which is a strategic national stockpile, um, to get additional items like PPE. Yep. Um, and so um, after this morning's meeting, they indicated that they're feeling pretty good about where they're at with masks and things like that. So, so that's good to hear. Yes. Last question I have for you. So I think there, again, everyone spoke on just rumors that they're hearing um, about this in our community. And you see it on social media just blowing up. So I don't envy your job having to um, kind of comb through that. Can you give us a general sense, if you can, just about where are these cases occurring throughout the county? Are they in the city of Sheboygan? Are they in the city of Plymouth and Kohler? Is it is it concentrated in one area or is it sort of so, individual by case? Yeah, it's it's pretty individual by case. Okay. Um, our, a, a majority of our cases are related to travel, um, either international or domestic. And so, um, and then contacts to cases that traveled other, so we have clusters of cases that are related to that travel experience. So, um, and they, they um, are spread throughout the county in, in various jurisdictions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Is there uh, any other questions? I do have more questions for other individuals. Mayor, Mayor Alderman Jim Boren, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I believe this question will also be from Star. <clears throat> uh, for Star, uh, I've been uh, getting the daily report, and I noticed the last three days there were three different uh, cases reported. And my constituents and some of my neighbors think it would be very helpful and maybe would cut down on some of the rumors that are going around if you could provide what city those cases are in. You know, are, are four of them in Random Lake, are four of them in Plymouth, are eight of them in Sheboygan? Uh, I think it would be helpful. You know, I understand HIPAA laws, but you're not naming the individual. I think it would be helpful if you could provide in tomorrow's report, if there's another case, where it is, and maybe where the cases have been so far. So, Decisions related to what we can release and what we can't. We've been um, uh, in consultation with our corporation counsel, our HIPAA compliance officer, and also just looking through best practice, public health, to try and decide what kinds of information we can release and what kinds of information we should not. Um, and so that's kind of been guiding the, the types of information that you're seeing in the report. Um, also, because we have a limited number of cases within our community, we certainly don't want to run the risk of having um, inadvertently um, 
sharing information that would lead back to um, community members being inadvertently identified as having COVID-19 mm -hmm. to protect their privacy and their confidentiality. So those conversations are happening regularly about what we can share safely and what we can't share safely. And um, so we, we make decisions about that um, on a case-by-case -case basis as we know more. We certainly, um, when we, the information that we share is the information that um, is needed to protect the health of the public. And we do share, um, you know, if there's any kinds of concerns about um, what um, what's needed to be shared in order to protect the health of the public, those are the types of messages that we're sharing. Thank you for that explanation. If I, no. could, if I, if I, if I sure. could follow up, Mary, I have one more question for Star. Go ahead, Jim. And, and if you're allowed to give up. If, uh, thank you. If you're allowed to give out this information, Star, uh, other questions I've been getting from my constituents is that have the cases been serious enough where the, the patients have actually been hospitalized or have they been the nature of the case where once they're identified, they've just been able to recover at home? So I believe that that is information that we do include in the daily update. Um, the, our, our cases right now are all in isolation at home. Thank you. Then back to Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next up is uh, the police chief. Um, um, chief Tomagowski, I know, um, and I appreciate you and the other law enforcement officials throughout the county sending out that press um, release just in terms of um, when folks are traveling and what's classified as essential and non-essential. Um, I've been getting a lot of those calls too and they're still coming in about how individuals um, um, have to manage through that. But one of my questions that I got from a constituent uh, today was concerned um, around out-of-state travelers and how, or if there's any pr uh, protocol um, for, for, for our uh, law enforcement um, offices, you know, if, if they see someone coming up from Illinois or coming in from Minnesota and staying at, you know, their summer home up here, is, is there any concern about community spread um, from a lot of these hotspots and, and do we monitor that at all or, or does the police I guess my, my question is, you know, how do we enforce folks when we know that they might not be necessarily essential, but they're coming here, um, you know, to stay at their summer home on the lake or something to those terms. So it's a loaded question in that um, there are seven questions in one question. Yeah. Essentially, it, it, I think the easiest way to answer it is we're looking for, for citizens to voluntarily comply with the guidance that's out there. Okay. We understand that the guidance isn't always clear, and so we need to try to use common sense and, and go through the guidelines and determine if it's essential or not. The governor, from the conversations that law enforcement has had with, with the governor's office, has tried to um, develop ways for that to happen. For biz businesses, whether they're essential or not, is through the WEDC. Um, they're trying to develop, my understanding is, some kind of call-in line to try to make that work as a smoother process. But it's quite clear that we do not have the resources to be able to monitor yeah. people in the way that you're suggesting. And quite frankly, somebody with out-of-state plates could be involved in essential business or essential travel to do those kinds of, of things. So really, uh, following the guidance and everybody um, complying is really the, the, the best method, I think. Okay. It, it, while I have the mic, I'm going to steal it for a second and say to, to the question that Jim Bourne asked about sharing individual city information, I think with the number of cases that we have in the community, the message that we need to send to the community is it doesn't matter which one it's at. We should all be treating these cases like they're happening in all of our communities, because if they're not right now, they're going to be very soon. Thank you very much. I, one more question for the chief. Go um, ahead. So, so with with the the stay the stay for at home order by the governor, this this creates a different social dynamic where individuals are staying in the homes um, much longer. In some cases, if there's a domestic violence situation, people are staying with their abuser. Kids are viewing violence in the home. Are we seeing a different shift in calls? Maybe maybe it's too premature for that. But are are there different natures of calls that we're getting um, that 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 are caused because people are staying home together in um, potentially violent or tumultuous situations. So I would say that a uh, similar kind of thing to what the fire chief said, our calls in general are, are down. Okay. Still seeing a lot of disturbances, but we're not seeing as many 
actual what I would call assaults. Okay. Um, so I so I think we're getting called um, before things are are heating up too much, um, but we are seeing some spike in in some of our property crimes, um, and so that's why we've been putting out the information and trying to shift resources to address some of those things. One of the things that was recently on our social media page was about our essentially, um, I won't think of what the program is now, of course, but our checks on our vehicle check program, something we've been doing for more than five years that's helped to drastically drive down our thefts from autos mm -hmm. because just like we're doing with public health, the response that we've done to, to um, law enforcement and policing in this community over the last 10 years isn't just focused on response, it's focused on prevention. So trying to get citizens to work with us to do those things that they can to prevent crime from happening be before or, or in something like a, a theft from auto, there's really two things going on there, a motivated offender and, and, a, and an available target. And we're trying to take that available target away so that the motivated offender has to work harder to find something um, to victimize somebody with. Cool. So I don't know if I answered your question or not. But <laughs> sort of, I appreciate it. Thanks, Chief. Um, if I could Adam, just, yeah, thank ahead. you, Mr. Mayor. If I could just kindly ask that if anybody has any questions of Star or Steve, if they could start with them, they're working incredibly long days, nights, weekends. And if you don't have any questions for them, I'd like to see them go home to their family. So yeah. I would just ask if, Mr. Mayor, if that'd be all right. Very good, thank you. Are there any other questions? I, I have more questions, if that's okay. One of them? Um, not from them. Okay, Unless are there any more folks. questions for Star or Steve from the county? Seeing none, you're dismissed. Thank you for your Thank time you so today. Is, is Deidre Martinez still on the phone? I am still here. Awesome. Can I ask you a few questions, Deidre, just kind of about... Um, some of the conversations that you're having with local business leaders, uh, whether that's um, small folks downtown that might be in the bid district or whether it's some of our larger employers throughout the community, are there different common themes that you're seeing um, with a lot of businesses that are struggling, um, whether it's, it's uh, maintaining their services or the, the, the food or um, other products that they provide? Um, what are businesses doing to support their families um, that, that they're laying off? Is, is there some sort of common theme or some sort of um, path forward that these businesses are looking for that, that you and your team have experienced? So I would say that um, of the industries or the smaller businesses hardest hit, now this is initial impact um, information, yeah. so certainly not the, the whole picture, just the current picture. And as I think Adam mentioned earlier, it is changing so rapidly, so drastically, we can barely keep up. So um, as I'm looking at the initial impact of some of our smaller businesses, uh, we've seen about 29% of our respondents tell us that they've reduced their hours due to demand, which means that they have laid off um, or limited hours of their workforce. And we've seen roughly 25, 25.5% of these of businesses close completely during this time, which means that there is a complete layoff of staff. Now, prior to uh, the, the bill that was passed earlier this week, or last, I don't know what day it is anymore, last week, um, I think there was a lot of concern about, holy Moses, what do I do to support my team um, at this time? I think that there, since the bill has passed, there, that has created uh, a little bit of level of, um, you know, kind of calm, if you will. And now it's a matter of getting them the right information on how to deploy, um, how do they get that info to their staff? How do they um, use that info for themselves? I mean, when we look at small business owners, you know, sometimes their staff can be taken care of, but um, they themselves as a business owner are kind of left, you know, without. So, you know, we're really looking at, um, you know, kind of twofold, what are the resources that they need to support their staff? Because what we also don't need is once the dust settles in a few months and everything kind of, you know, hopefully goes back to normal as, um, as it was or as it can be, that we also don't have businesses that can't open their doors because of lack of resources and or because of lack of workforce, which mm -hmm. is something that we've experienced in this community for quite some time now. 
So we, you know, that's really kind of some of the concerns that they're sharing with us is what are the resources? How do I access them? And they're not looking for this, um, you know, kind of big pie in the sky idea of what it means. They want direction. They want step by step, go to this website, do this thing, talk to this, you know, XYZ person. Um, they need directive. And, you know, so that is where my staff and myself and our partners have really been trying to kind of hunker down and figure out what, what does that directive look like? Um, who should be giving it? So if it's, if we're just a conduit of information, who is the right person um, that we have access to that can share that information with them so that they're hearing it from, you know, subject matter experts and, you know, not, not just the Chamber of Commerce. Um, but, you know, the, the concerns are certainly health and well-being, right? Nobody wants their friends or their employees or their family members or what have you to get sick. But then how am I going to, you know, pay for this? And am I going to have enough money to reopen my doors when the dust settles? So those would be your three, like, largest concerns that we are hearing from our folks right now. Okay. Thanks, Deidre. I appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions for me? Because I am going to remove myself from the call as well. Thanks for being there, Deidre. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Have a wonderful evening. Will do. I did have one last question for the city administrator, if that's okay. Go ahead. Unless more questions come up. I'm you just never leaving know. your light on. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, Daryl, I, I, I hope, I think it was you or Mike um, in your statement that, that we've been communicating with our, our state representatives and uh, individuals from um, at, at the state level. Have, have, have they provided feedback at all or given any insight um, about how they plan to support the city in our larger community just with, with a lot of the information that we've shared. I think oh, there's been a lot of departments and, and uh, individuals throughout the community that have expressed um, um, struggles that they're, they're facing. Definitely, you know, props to our city clerk and her team um, for making sure that we can carry out the election. But just in terms of, you know, election security, safety, um, I'm worried that, you know, what we see going on with people flushing down disinfectant wipes down pipes, you know, is that going to, um, cause more um, infrastructure damage? You know, or, or are they planning on resources um, that the city might be able to have access to um, in terms of um, how they can help us out? That was a big question and uh, just, just a general sense of, you know, how they're digesting mm -hmm. the information, what they're saying, right. and what feedback they're giving yeah. back to us. Uh, state elected uh, representatives, both Senate uh, and Assembly, uh, have been in contact with city staff as well as uh, uh, city leadership. Uh, they've uh, uh, asked us to verify if, if we do need any additional information from them or the governor's office. Um, we uh, have a great resource, as many of you do have, through the League of Wisconsin Municipalities as far as being a clearinghouse for us of uh, programs and uh, key information as it affects our operations. Uh, we, are, we do have a, a tally of, of costs that we're keeping track of if we should be so fortunate to uh, be able to uh, seek reimbursement for s some of our costs. I think our hard cost, not unfortunately any of our soft costs being uh, personnel related, uh, I don't think those will be reimbursed either at the state or federal level. Uh, Chad Pelashek on, on the city's behalf did receive information as a result of the federal legislation mm -hmm. that additional block grant monies uh, may be coming our way based upon the current formula. Uh, but going back to your original question, uh, again, there is a dialogue or discussions with uh, state uh, uh, representatives uh, for the city of Sheboygan and the county. Uh, they, they're concerned um, and, and they are uh, ready to uh, uh, try and be responsive to any way in which they can help. Uh, but as, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, early uh, last week, uh, uh, the mayor and uh, county administrator Payne uh, did have a one-on-one -on -one call with Governor Evers, which I think was helpful for a, a two-way conversation. Thank you, Daryl. And I should add to that that today, Senator uh, Tammy Baldwin called uh, to make sure that we understood, you know, the federal uh, legislation they did to help our cities. And so she explained that in more detail and also was interested in our local situation and how we were doing. Good. And I believe uh, Terry Kotsma did call as well and uh, just wanted to check in as, and, and see how we were doing. Cool. Any other questions? 
Okay, then we'll move on to uh, resolutions. No other uh, questions? <laughs> item 3.1 is resolution number 196 of 1920 by Alderpersons Wolf and Donahue establishing an early retirement incentive program, and that will be referred to the Finance and Personnel Committee. And with that, we're ready to accept the motion to adjourn. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Signify by saying aye. 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 We, we stand adjourned. Thank aye. you very aye. much. Aye. Aye.